Eyes Advisory Board, and you're representing yeah. us, that board, and you're giving it. And then Eduardo, then I'm going to do the short presentation of the summer school and talk briefly about it, and then I'm going to introduce you, and then you go. Okay. Yes? Okay. okay. Great. Good afternoon. Uh, we want to start by warmly welcoming you to the first late afternoon seminar of the 20th, the 20th, not the 20th, the 13th, the tw I'm sorry, I'm, the 11th, yes, it's been a long day, sorry. I'm thinking 2020, 11th, I'm thinking lots of different numbers. Uh, to the 11th Ipsos B Summer School, uh, it's a really warm uh, privilege to, to be starting the late afternoon seminars, which are a really important part of the school because it's a part of where we all come together. And since it's the first time that we're all coming together, uh, together as a school, uh, we're going to start by also, uh, we have a, at the table with me, joining me, uh, Professor Guy Witten, who is here, as you know, is also uh, teaching in the summer school, but is also a member of the International Advisory Board of the summer school. And so um, and we're going to start by having a, a welcome from Professor Guy Witten. And then also joining me uh, is Professor Eduardo Marquez on, uh, on the immediate, the, the farthest from, away from me, uh, but not the farthest away from me in reality, because we're, he's also in the Department of Political Science here at the University of Sao Paulo, and the, direct, the incoming director of the Center for the Study of the Metropolis, and a very strong supporter of the summer school and the work we do here. So Eduardo will also be, I'm, we're going to ask him to speak. And then after that, uh, I'm going to just make some brief welcome remarks on, to talk a little about what we're doing this, this season and this session of the summer school. And I'm really excited and very honored that we have to open the session and to do our seminar. We have Professor Kirby Goidel here from Texas A&M University who will be giving the talk. Okay, so turn it over to Guy. Okay. Well, thank you, and, and uh, welcome, everybody. I, I definitely see some uh, familiar faces, so it's really really nice to see uh, some folks that have come back and are taking classes again. Uh, I welcome back, and I also see a lot of new faces. Uh, it's it's amazing. You know, I was I was part of the first group of instructors uh, at the at the very first summer school here, and uh, you know we're much bigger now, and and uh, it really has a great reputation and. We're seeing some of the folks that uh, were here in the beginning are now professors uh, around the world, and they're sending their students here. Uh, so it's it's just great to be back, and and uh, I always love the the spirit here. Everybody's uh, here very seriously uh, pursuing their studies, but also having a good time and building the network because these are people that you'll see for years and years, uh, and just a great pleasure to be back. Thank you. Thank you. I think the, the other one is uh, No. No? No. Here. Oh. How about this? Thanks a lot. <laughs> Hello, every Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Eduardo Marques. I'm, uh, as Lorena said, um, I'm representing the Center for Metropolitan Studies here. I have been uh, uh, involved in the summer school for years. Uh, I was part of the local organizing committee for five years, and uh, it's really a pleasure to be here, to see you again, and to be a again at the summer school. Uh, I think uh, the summer school has been uh, one of the most important uh, uh, initiatives in the spread of the use of uh, data-driven, uh, data-anchored, data uh, analysis in the social sciences in Brazil. Um, it's really has been really important to the creation of a network of people who come here and, and connect to others and connect to us and we connect to, to foreign professors and and it's really really uh, nice, uh, important and it's all, it's also fun as Guy just mentioned. Um, uh, I, I'm um, among the persons who think that we can do both. We can do very good work and at the same time uh, be happy. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, 
And uh, in saying, uh, as Lorena said, I'm, I'm uh, becoming again the director of the Center for Metropolitan Studies, which is a center um, of the University of Sao Paulo devoted to the study of metropolitan issues, as uh, urban issues, as uh, the name states, but also uh, 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 issues around the social inequalities uh, in a multidimensional uh, uh, understood in a multidimensional way, and uh, we have been uh, supporters of the summer school for a long time, but now we are uh, uh, getting even closer to the summer school, um, and uh, for the next years we'll have a partnership which, which will be even stronger than the one we had before. And I'm very proud of this, and I'm very happy to be here and to welcome you all to this. Thank you. Okay. So we're here, um, and before we, we start the late afternoon se uh, session, and since it's the f first time we're sitting here and we're all here together, and this microphone is in my face and in my eyes, um, what we wanted to do is to talk to you guys a little bit about and tell a little bit about this, this season and about what's different, what we're doing, thank you, Jonathan. Um, what's different, what are we doing this, what's the vision of the school? It's a new decade for the summer school. Uh, last year we were really excited, we celebrate 10 years, which was an amazing accomplishment for the la largest methods school in the global south of the International Political Science Association. And we decided this year, it's the 11th year, it's a new decade. What's the vision that we have and that we want to communicate as a school of the kind of work that we're trying to do in this school and what makes it very unique? Um, and so we thought it was really important to start, uh, since we're starting, and also for our invited guests who are here to just talk briefly about that and what our work, what we're doing. Um, so I want to start by first uh, acknowledging uh, Eduardo, uh, as Eduardo said, a school of this size and of this breadth we start working on in February. So right after the summer school uh, ends, we're already starting and we're trying to start to think through what we're going to do and what we want, what, where we're trying to go, because uh, we like to think of the summer school is not an event. The summer school it, for us is an institution, and you don't build institutions as events. <laughs> You build institutions with uh, in a very different way. And so it has to be something that all 365 days of the year we're thinking, breathing, and, and trying to keep this growing and to be, be something that's very live and dynamic and organic part of, of the university. And so what does that mean? Uh, we really count on funders. And funders, without funders, it would be very difficult for us to run a school of this size. Um, we would love to be able to do more support than we have. Uh, we would love to have more scholarships because to us, methods is a really important talking about inequality and talking about inequality of social science research. Without empowering students and researchers with the right equipment and tools, it's very difficult to level the playing field. And that's what we see as a fundamental mission of this school. And the work we do in this school is to bring leading research and show we can produce it here. Um, and so we need to do that with strong support from financial agencies and funding. And so everything we do, uh, we count on huge supporters. And I'm really proud that we have uh, the Center for the Study for, the, the, for SEN uh, to be partnering with the summer school has always been a really strong believer. And I have to say, what's really incredible about SEN, not only because uh, the financial support, but the researchers in SEN have taken classes in the summer school, the faculty, that lead SEN, the leading social scientists that are at the cutting edge of Brazilian social science and are part of SEN. It's such an honor that we've been able to help them, to provide them with new perspectives, new methods sometimes, or, or different things. SEN has participated as, as le, uh, learning in the school, sending students, sending researchers. So the SEN now, uh, it's really wonderful to be able to count on SEN 
and for us to have uh, a longer partnership with SEN to, to have more guaranteed funding in order to try to think about planning uh, the summer school. It helps us to have more stable sources of support. And I can't uh, stop uh, and take off kind of the hat of I have you here as IPSA, but I also really want to acknowledge the support of Texas A&M University and the Department of Political Science at Texas A&M University because without uh, Professor Witten and, and the Department of Political Science at Texas A&M has made a huge investment in partnering with us to say we believe this is something that can be really uh, life-changing and they send students to take our courses, they send students to help work with us uh, in developing the school and Guy has also been a really strong believer in the school and thinking through where we're going. Um, so I wanna say thank you. Uh, we also, of course, want to thank FAPESPI, CAPES, um, the other parts of the university who make this school possible, including the Provost Office for Research, the Provost Office for Graduate Studies, uh, the Institute of International Relations, our school, the Department of Political Science, belongs to the School of Social Sciences and Philosophy and Humanities, and has also been a very strong supporter of the summer school. and. Uh, a lot of a lot of things that make this school happen. We count on all these supporters. For some reason, the clicker is not clicking. It's on. I don't know why. Okay, but I'm going to do this. It's still not clicking. Yes, it is. Okay. So there's, you see we had all the logos, but I was just trying to click. So who are we? What did we get? Where did we get to in the 11th session? We have 159 students, individuals, this in these four weeks of the summer school. That means 374 student courses because we count you also as how many of you are, are doing more than one class. And so as, I, as you can see, the majority of the people who come invest in not only one week of learning, but really are here uh, in a more sustained uh, in We have 19 countries are represented in the summer school, uh, which is also really important to the summer school. We believe that social science and science in general doesn't have passports and to build an international school and the fact that people from all over the world trust and come to learn in this school, it's a privilege and we really wanna welcome uh, the people here, who are here from, the scholars that are here from other countries. Uh, this is a map that shows some of the, the places and the, where you're from and we hope we've colored the map correctly. Um, the map, as you can guess, the orange parts are the, the parts that we have represented in this session, yes? Um, so hopefully every year our goal is to become more international and to, to really continue to grow the school and to grow these relationships because we believe that those are also relationships that can start, comparative research that can be done in the future. You can meet in a class in the school, who knows what that can be in five years time. Uh, and so what did we do this year that's a little bit different? What we decided to do in the 11th, se 11th session in the new decade is we decided to move into a much more, uh, a much more, uh, how we can say, in the last years of the summer school, we started kind of starting, sow the seeds anywhere and see what happens. And now in the new decade, what we're really trying to do is to build tracks. And to the, the vision of the school and what we're trying to, do, to build is to think about what we want to do is create tracks that over the course of four weeks of study, they, the courses fit together, there's dialogue, there's coherence, and we're providing kind of also a roadmap for students of, if you're trying to get expertise in a certain area, this is a, a set of courses that makes sense. And what's exciting about it is that it also gives us the opportunity as faculty to work across uh, faculty to build these tracks. And so to get out of just teaching our specific method and think bigger picture about what does it mean to be responsible for building a track. Uh, the tracks in comparative historical methods, comparative research and ethnography, interviews and ethnography, causal inference and experiments, time series and panel data analysis, multi-methods research, modeling and analyzing public opinion and uh, political theory. Those are the tracks that we're hoping to build and continue to sustain 
for the next uh, decade and hopefully to add more if we can. But we really want to be that those, the school, what is this school about? It's about an institution that's seeking to develop research in these core areas and develop expertise in these core areas. And that's what our goal is. Uh, who are the students? Who are you? So among the pool of people in the classroom, 11% are faculty, 6% are postdocs. 34% of you are PhDs, which is awesome because as methodologists, we think that you have to keep learning. Your degree is not you're done. The de degree is just the beginning and methods are dynamic and the field is changing and we have to continue to be in a school so we can keep, to be, keep up with what's going on. Uh, and so it's really great to be say that a third of our students are have doctorate degrees. Uh, we have 27%, so almost a third that are masters. And isn't this amazing for Brazil? 22% uh, are undergrads, right? So we're getting a really, we have the future of social science is really strong in terms of there's a lot of interest now at the undergraduate level of starting early and being exposed to methods. Um, Okay, the faculty. As you know, the faculty is very diverse, and we, we just list here. I'm not going to read the whole list, but the point is to really underscore that we're trying to find not because of the passport of the person nor the institution where they belong, but to just underscore that we really want to build the best school we can and bring the best people we can to teach those methods. And we're really lucky to have faculty represented from these institutions who we're also grateful to because, as you know, many of the faculty are right now teaching at their home institutions. And so their home institutions are supporting the school by saying, yes, that's an initiative that it's worth taking time out of your semester to come and invest and teach methods in Brazil. Uh, so we're really thankful to these institutions that allow their faculty to be a part of our school. Uh, and then I think... We have another thing that we really want to also underscore. We've worked really hard when we started and we won over the next decade that we really see that the afternoon sessions that are being led by young, uh, young, promising, dynamic, very committed, serious scholars, uh, the teaching fellows. And we're really happy that that's a really diverse group of in students and institutions. And so uh, this, is, this isn't them, but uh, this is our institutions, and we're really happy also to have them as part of our faculty because we see them as trying to lead the charge along with the, the, with the, the instructors. Uh, just briefly, uh, we really hope that as alumni of the school now and as following us, you continue to, to follow us on the website and the, on Facebook and Instagram. We're trying to build a community and, and we hope to kind of continue the dialogue and communication in future years and in this session also to be getting the word out. Um, okay, so I'm going to just start uh, by now uh, turning over. I'm going to invite Eduardo and Guy to... Uh, you guys can sit down. And I'm going to start by now introducing Professor Kirby Goidel. Um, Jonathan, while I'm introducing Kirby, if you could help me, maybe to just make sure we have his presentation up on the, yes, okay. And I think I forgot one thing that was very important. So I, this also gives me a good opportunity to introduce uh, Jonathan Phillips and Glauco Pérez, uh, yes. So uh, in the Department of Political Science, the people who share and are really leading the school is the three of us. Right, the headaches and the, the joys and the pain and the, the fun stuff. So Jonathan and, and Glauco and I were also really, I'm really lucky to ha count on them and I wanna really thank them for all of their work. Uh, okay, so now we're ready to start the, left, the, the, the late afternoon seminar and to get to the meanings of democracy among mass publics. And before we do that, uh, I would like to introduce Professor Kirby Goidel. Uh, his research is motivated by questions of democratic governance including uh, he sought to analyze whether citizens are up to the task of gov democratic governance, the willingness and ability of elites to manipulate public opinion, and the institutional mechanisms which translate democratic inputs into policy. 
at Texas A&M University. He is a professor in the Department of Communication and soon to be a member of the Department of Political Science at Texas A&M. Yes? <laughs> and he is also currently the director of public, the Public Policy Research Institute at Texas A&M University. And among his publications, his, his books, uh, I'm going to just read the title. Um, among his, his published work uh, is the book, Misreading the Bill of Rights, The Top Ten Myths Concerning Your Rights and Liberties. Um, he's also authored the text, America's Failing Experiment, How We the People Have Become the Problem. And he's edited and contributed to po political polling in the digital aid. Political polling in a digital age. The challenge of measuring and understanding public opinion. Uh, he's here in the summer school. He's here as, uh, to deliver the, this late afternoon seminar. But he's also here because on Saturday, he's changing his hat to, to the other hat, hat he wears, which is he is the ed editor of Social Science Quarterly. And we invited him to lead a workshop on surviving the peer review process. And so we're very much looking forward because he's going to help us with the, the angst and the, the joy and the pain of, of publishing the discipline on Saturday in, in a really great workshop in the morning. Um, so Kirby, uh, warm, uh, the, a very warm welcome. Thank you. Welcome to Brazil. Welcome to the summer school. everybody doing? Thank you. Thank you. I hope it works. If not, let's just check. Yes. Okay. We're good. All right. All right. Thank you all very much. Um, I just want to start off just saying I'm kind of humbled to be here. Guy had been saying for some years, he's like, I've got to get you down to Brazil sometime. Uh, and I was like, you name the time. We'll figure out a way to make this work. Uh, and I'm just really amazed at the energy about everything, all the, all the great things that are going on. Um, this is, this is a, a fantastic program, and I'm, I'm glad to be part of it in any way possible uh, for the energy. Um, and, and also just in terms of like in, in thinking about methods, and, and, and I know all you all know this or you wouldn't be here, but it's like such an exciting time where we're seeing so much data come together uh, and so much methodological innovation. Uh, like when you look at sort of, uh, it, it's just exponential in terms of what you all are learning and what you all are able to do compared to, say, when I was in graduate school uh, many, many years ago. And, and it's, it's just, I, I find it an incredibly uh, exciting time. So um, let me, okay. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the meanings of democracy uh, among, specifically among mass publics. Uh, and, and I wanted to uh, talk about it. I'm going to do a couple of things. One, I'm going to talk within the American context. Most of my background and, and, and uh, work has been uh, within the American context, and so that's really where I'm going to focus. Uh, and then as we move forward, I'm going to show you a little bit of information and a little bit of data uh, from the, um, uh, in a comparative context as well. The, the fundamental question that, that, I'm, that, that we're asking here is how does the public understand democracy? Uh, and arguably, this is one of the more important questions uh, within contemporary political science. Um, and so there's at least a, a case, a question to be asked, why should we bother asking this question? Again, a lot of people have looked at it in a, in a, in a, in a lot of different ways. Okay? Uh, I thought, so this is, so some of the initial stuff I'm going to show you is just sort of setting up the problem and setting up why I think the approach that we take is a little bit different uh, and, and can give us a little bit different insight in, in terms of what's been done before. And, and so we start off with the idea of just uh, Easton's famous definition between uh, diffuse and specific support, knowing that what we want to get at uh, when we're talking about support for democracy and about public support for democracy is the idea that there's some underlying support for the political process that is separate and different from any independent support, uh, um, any, any specific support for an administration. The people are actually committed to the rules of the game that's being played, and that they support the rules of the game no matter who is winning and no matter, and no, no matter who is losing. Now, Easton himself, when he's writing and, and making this, this early distinction, also acknowledges well, empirically this is really tough. We know that sometimes governments will not perform well, and that that will affect 
uh, that, that there will be this difficulty in separa separating out uh, the diffuse support from the specific support. But, what, but, but part of what I wanted to think about here is how do we get at this lower level of support by getting at how the public under, understands, uh, understands democracy. Um, one way that we've, we've tried to get at it is to ask questions about democratic satisfaction. Now, I'm going to show you a, several different things as we go through here. This is from a module of the 2016 Congressional Cooperative uh, Election Study uh, done in the United States. There's pre and there's post data, uh, and this was a model that we put to, module that we put together, and we asked both before and after the election, what's the level of satisfaction uh, with democracy? It was on a 11-point uh, scale, ranging from zero, no satisfaction, to 11. It's similar to items you've seen before in other, in, in other types of measures, and I don't think this is going to surprise anybody terribly, but what we find with democratic satisfaction is uh, after the election, satisfaction shifts depending on who's winning and who's losing, right? And so, um, so we see strong, the more Republican you are, the more happy you are with the election outcome, and the more satisfied you are uh, than with democratic governments. Um, and so this, this idea that we can just ask about democracy uh, and get at this level of diffuse support is, is problematic because, of, because it's tied in with, with these specific considerations. By the way, just as a side note, we had some other uh, indicators within this, we had ideology, we had racial resentment, we, we had religious, uh, religious beliefs, and all of these work the same way. And actually the racial resentment one was, was really kind of fascinating, that people who are more racially resentful became much more positive after the 2016 election. People who were sort of, you might think of as being less supportive of democracy, became more supportive of democracy after the election relative to, to, to before the election. Okay? Um, Another way that we've tried to gauge this is by asking in open-ended questions, um, what do you, you know, what, what comes to mind when we ask you about, about democracy? And we just allow people to say what they think about this in their own words. Um, as, as part of this project, we've been going back and, and looking at some old survey data just from the, just from the Roper archives. Uh, and the earliest question that I found so far where they asked this was, I think, 1947. And, and if we plotted this up, it would look somewhat like this. The difference would be the people would be larger and freedom would be smaller. But, but for the most part, the, the same type of items and the same type of considerations that, that come up when we ask it in 2016 looked very similar. Uh, and you can see uh, asking before and after, you know, I thought this will be a great little fun thing to do. We'll see a big difference after the election relative to before the election. No, it's, it's all about freedom. Um, and, and so the responses. Also, when we look at it cross-nationally, we find that uh, there's a lot of similarity cross-nationally as, as well. And so uh, Dalton, uh, in particular, Dalton Chen, uh, have, have looked at this and argued what this means is uh, that there's a shared understanding of democracy. And so when we ask about democracy in a survey question, for example, it's, it's okay because people are coming to it from the same perspective. Um, they're, coming it to, they're coming to it from a perspective of, of, um, of, of Western liberal democracy, those, those types of ideas that emphasize freedom and, uh, and, and both the, the liberal component and, and the democratic component. Now, that work has been criticized uh, most... most uh, sort of by, by Bratton, among others, and, and one of their arguments is we shouldn't even be asking about democracy at all because it's such a value-laden term. Um, and even if we get something like this, uh, the, the, the problem is we don't really know what people cross-culturally mean by freedom. Uh, even within the U.S., you can say, does one racial group or one regional group mean the same thing when they're talking about, uh, about freedom? So it, ra it raises a lot of questions uh, about how best to do it. One of their suggestions is, instead of asking about uh, uh, democracy specifically, ask about characteristics of democracy, right? And, and ask about, and, and then look at that in order to get a better sense. From this, one of the things that they, that, that type of research has, has said, no, instead of one understanding of democracy, there are probably at least two, sort of a substantive versus procedural uh, d distinction between democracy, and maybe three if we talk about sort of a minimalist understanding of democracy, which is just about the competition and choosing between elites versus a more rights-oriented versus a more, um, uh, a more substantive type of democracy, which includes 
economic rights and considerations. Right? Um, so also, another way that we get at diffuse support is, is through political trust. This is from the Pew Research Center over time. This is also limited to the, to the U.S. context, but this is the tr trust by uh, partisan affiliation. Um, and, and so what we see with trust and partisan affiliation is a long-term decline, especially in the 1970s uh, into, the, into the 1980s. Uh, and then it depends both on events and then also what party is in power. So the party that is in power is more trusting of government. The party that's out of power is, is less trusting of government. By the way, in, the 19, uh, in 1973, Huntington uh, Crozier and, and uh, we're getting, uh, uh, wrote a uh, crisis of democracy paper for the Trilateral Commission uh, and, and noted that this was, uh, that the trust was too low for government to continue, and yet it, it's, it's continued. Uh, not to dismiss trust entirely, I think it captures a lot of diffuse uh, support. There are a lot of considerations there. We know from work from Hetherington and Rudolph and others that uh, trust matters in the sense that uh, it takes away support for government and for government activism, uh, and, it, and it leads to more conservative uh, policy outcomes. But it's problematic if we're trying to get at this, uh, this diffuse support nation, notion. Right? Um, so in that context, I thought I'd bring up some of, the, some of the literature on democratic backsliding and the idea that, well, support for democracy is probably declining. Um, and, and this is maybe the most uh, famous, uh, at least in terms of the public presence of, of this particular argument. And the chart there um, shows that among younger generations, what hap is happening is there are fewer people who are saying that is, a, that is essential to live in a democratic government. Uh, and so the, the suggestion or the argument is maybe support for democracy is declining. Um, but we also have to ask, and especially given what we know about these distinctions between diffuse and specific support, whether it's really declining support for democracy or whether it's a democratic deficit, whether what's really happening is government isn't providing what people want, and so there is some, maybe some apparent decline in support for democracy, but it's not really, it's about performance rather than about uh, the theoretical or, or the ideological uh, commitment to, to democracy. And within the U.S. case, we can argue that the, the younger group of voters are also, or the younger group of citizens are also the ones who should be most upset about the performance of democracy because it hasn't performed well for them. Okay? Um, and so how do we balance these, these two things? Okay? Uh, Malk uh, understands this. Uh, at least in, in, in terms of making the distinction between liberal and illiberal democracies, whether someone is committed to the principles of liberalism. Um, and this, this term, illiberal democracy, has been around for a while, and the concern about the rise of illiberal democracy has been going up. But this is, uh, the reason I threw, put this up is this is sort of an elite definition, right? And so this is, this is how we think about it, but the question is, does the public think about it? Do they combine things in these ways? Do they separate the idea of liberalism from democracy? Or, or do they separate the idea of the provision of social goods and, and public goods from the idea of democracy? Uh, and so, uh, so even though this is helpful because we're getting at this distinction between um, the, the various different definitions of democracy, we don't know if this is the way the mass public is actually thinking about it. Okay? Um, also, in the context of, of uh, uh, democratic backsliding is the argument that elites are manipulating uh, democratic norms, uh, and, and so they're undermining support for democracy by their behavior. Um, and, and so uh, one of the things that, if, if I could do this the way I would like to do, separate, if I had the data, had the resources, had the, had the mental capacity to really, to really do this the way I want, what I would have is I would have overtime data of the public's understanding of democracy, elite conversations about democracy, and then we would be able to see how these things interact, uh, to see how context is affecting how the public understands, un understands uh, democracy. Because obviously the conversations between the elites would also be affecting the public. And the public then would also be feeding back to the, to the elites in terms of telling them what is acceptable or what is not acceptable. Um, and, we, and we have a, so a couple of papers, one by uh, 
Dahlberg and a couple of other people. This is this is I think this is a really cool paper if you if you can find it. It's not I don't think it's published. I think it's still online. It's 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 uh, but it looks at the semantics and what it does is it captures online conversations about democracy and it captures editorials about democracy. And what they look at is they look cross nationally and they look to see whether it's talked about in terms of community, in terms of process, in terms of procedure, uh, just exactly what the language is. And what they show is that across countries, uh, democracy is talked about differently. Uh, it's, it's hard to tell in the chart that they have just how differently, but the conversations that you go from place to place are different, and that should matter, right? Uh, how, those, how those conversations uh, are, are going. Also, just to, just to, to acknowledge the, the work and the importance within this, the elite context, we also have recent work suggesting that um, by Nihan and uh, Graham and, and Slovak, Slovak uh, about uh, when, when norms are violated, the public doesn't necessarily punish based on the norms. There is some procedural understanding. We know that going back to, to Hibbing and Tees Morse, uh, the, the procedural, there are process and procedural considerations about democracy, but when an elite violates the norms, oftentimes it's partisanship that, play, that plays a stronger role in terms of how they respond to some sort of violation of democratic norms. Okay. All right, so, um, what I hope to get, to get at this point is this understanding that sort of what we're doing is all great and it's all connected in important ways, but maybe there's another way to think about it. Uh, and our approach to think about it is, is really to think within the context of latent cluster analysis or latent profile analysis. So uh, really latent profile, more, uh, uh, what we're doing and in, in to distinguish this is between a factor analysis uh, and, and what a latent profile or a latent cluster analysis is going to do. So factor analysis, we're going to cluster the variables and the indicators of democracy together, and we're going to say these all go together and they look like substantive considerations, and these all go together and they look like procedural considerations. What latent cluster analysis is going to do is it's going to group people into groups, individuals into groups, based on how they are connecting those things. So again, instead of us saying what democracy, and I, and I draw a parallel here really in the work on uh, the, the, the classic work on ideology, when Converse came out and said, there's not much ideological thinking in the mass public, a lot of people looked at it and said, yeah, that's true, but you're imposing a definition, an understanding of what ideological thinking should be, and instead we should go in and talk to people and find out how they're structuring their world. Right? And so in the same context with democracy, instead of saying, this is what we think democracy should be, and we want to see whether you adhere to our notion, what we want to do is, as best we can, try to figure out how they're thinking about it. Okay? So in the, in the scope of the results that I'm going to show you, again, these are all from the U.S. context, uh, and these are all um, 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 from the Cooperative Congressional Election Study module that we did. We're looking specifically at, uh, so we had 2016 data and 2017 data. Uh, we have 1,000 respondents in, in each group. Um, and in the, and uh, the, the problem, one issue that we ran into is we only asked, we asked 15 of the items in the, in the 16 data, but then only six of the items in the 2017 data. So this was just bad planning on, on my part. So I want to say our part, but the, the hour here, the, I am the hour here. So, so, so here are the items that we, that, that we included in terms of in, in terms of initial modeling. These are built on the idea of the essential characteristics of democracy, so it fits in more with the, the, the Bratton critique of let's ask about specific items um, and, and let's see how, how people respond to those. It includes uh, majority versus minority rights, uh, the free speech, uh, participation, uh, equal treatment of citizens, uh, and then some substantive items on reducing income equality uh, in basic necessities. Um, so we'd like to have more items, uh, and, and, but we decided that we were better off with more observations and combining the two years uh, and using the, the, the fewer indicators. I'll come back to the, to the items, items specifically uh, in, the 20, in the 2016 data. Um, now, in terms of the, the latent class analysis, what it does is this, this is a unobserved machine learning, um, and uh, it's, a, it's a mixture model. And so what it's doing is it's finding the patterns within the data. Um, so some of you all may 
look askance at, at this particular idea, but because it's, it's not, we're not being, we're not being theoretical or asking what the, the data is revealing the pattern to us. Uh, and out of the, uh, at the the measures, what we are essentially doing is iteratively looking at this, looking at a one one class model, two class going down uh, until we get to the class that provides the best fit to the data. Uh, and the best fit to the data in this particular case, using the Bayesian information criterion, is the four class solution. Okay. Um, and it looks something like this. So um, we get four different classes. Now down at the bottom, I don't know if you all can, can see this very well, it also gives us some sense of what's going on in terms of the size of each of these groups. Uh, and, and so what, what percentage of, of the population we would assume that that group actually represented. So the first class uh, that, that we talk about is the indifferent class, uh, just sort of across the board. They're in the middle of the scale. They don't seem to care very much. Uh, they don't seem to value one thing very much over another. The good news about this class is it's fairly small, right? Uh, it's, it's about 11% of the, of the overall to total. Uh, it tends to be that this is a fairly low education class. Uh, this is, tends to be more, and, and this is the, the U.S. case, uh, more independent, more nonpartisan, um, so more distant from, from politics over, across the board in, in, in lots of different ways. Okay? Our second group, and, and one other point just to make, the, the terms that we use, the classes emerge from the data, the labels are, of course, what we gave it, and we played with various different labels. And, and uh, so the minimal class, we were also calling libertarian. Uh, you know, you'll see where that one's probably not as problematic. This one is more uh, better, edu better educated voters. Um, they see democracy largely in procedural terms. They completely reject the idea of government as providing public goods. Our, mostly rejected, right? Those are really low scores on, they say that's not an essential government function at all, okay? Uh, our, third, our, our third group is a moderate group. Uh, we played around with calling this neoliberal. Uh, this is a group that kind of moves a little bit back and forth. They're the, even though that score on the majority rights, they're the most majoritarian of the groups that we have. Um, and so, and then they move more in the direction of, of providing public goods but they're still not, not all the way to the, uh, to the, to the maximum value there. Uh, and then the final group is the maximum group, um, and here they want it all, right? They want democracy in terms of procedure, they want democracy in terms of rights, and they want democracy in terms of public goods. As it turns out, so the minimalist group is very well educated, but it's also old and white, right? The maximum group is really well educated, but it's very diverse, right? It's also younger. Okay? And now the indifferent group is also very young. So, and you, and you can see that. Uh, but, so what we get is very different classifications in terms of, in, in terms of these different groups and in terms of what they believe in about democracy. Uh, and, these, and these differences, we think, sort of, they make some intuitive sense. They, they, they fit with sort of uh, what, what we might expect. Okay? Now, before I expect you to buy this entirely, I want to show you a couple of other things that I think are, are kind of cool. Um, first, these are the other items that we didn't include uh, because they were only in the 2016 data. We said, well, if, if we have these classifications and we could put people in these classifications, maybe one, one way to sort of validate it is to look what happens in the items that we didn't include. Uh, and as it turns out, when we look at voting and elections, people being able to openly criticize all the items that we have here, uh, it kind of works out that the classes seem to work, um, that, that, it's, that it falls out as, as you might expect. And, and, and as, uh, so uh, we're not saying this is a complete validation, but, but we feel a little bit better about our classifications. By the way, the gray there is the distribution and the, and the, and the red is the mean uh, of that for that particular, that particular item. One other sort of criticism we thought about. Well, you're talking about government, so isn't this just ideology? I mean, isn't this just left-right? I mean, you have the one group that looks awful conservative, and then you have the other group that looks awful liberal, and then you have a group in between. And so what we wanted to see is, is there a distinction between how people place themselves, place themselves on an ideological scale and where they came out in terms of these classifications? 
Uh, and so here are those results. Um, and as you would expect, uh, we do find some of this. The minimalist group is more conservative. The maximalist group is, is more liberal. Uh, however, there's a lot of variance within these, within these groups. So if you're looking at the maximalist group, it's not even 50% that are self-identified liberals. There's a pretty decent chunk there, just under 20% of maximalists who identify as conservative. We think, and we haven't gone through this entirely, we think these are Trump populists, right? These are, these are people who, uh, who are populist at some level. They, they say they're conservative, but what they really want is government to take care of a lot of problems that they, that they, and inequalities that they, that they perceive. Uh, even on the, the minimalist group, which is one of the larger groups, uh, I mean one of the more ideologically sorted groups, you, you have distinctions in terms, of, uh, in, in terms of the difference between, you have a number of liberals and you have a number of moderates in, in, that, in that particular classification. So it doesn't look to us like it's just, a, it is ideology because by definition it's ideology. But it doesn't map neatly to self-placement as ideology. It also, in, in, and I'm not going to show this, but in other work that we did, we bits, built scales out of policy positions that are available in the, in the data, uh, and it doesn't, it doesn't map neatly to policy preferences either. So if we're thinking about this, if you wanted to think about all these things as measures of ideology, you could say, well, there's self-placement, there's policy positions, and then there's this thing, which is what do we believe about the role of democracy uh, that, that, I, that I think is separate and unique and, and provides unique uh, explanatory power uh, to models. So. so now the comparative stuff. So we also wanted to look and see how this works in, the, in, in, a, in a comparative context. And so we looked at the World Value Study. Here are the items that, that we used in this particular um, context. Um, as it turns out, we made some bad decisions here early on. Uh, so I want to acknowledge these. One, we wanted to look at this over time. And I'll come back to that uh, in, in sort of the conclusions to see how these classifications worked over time. So we started with the wave five. Uh, and, and we probably should have started uh, with wave six. We also wanted to try to see how well this matched, so we tried to pull the items that were sort of closest to the items that we already had that were in the world value study uh, in the, wave, in the wave, uh, uh, wave five data. We selected countries that were six or higher on the polity index, uh, and we tried to make sure that it was representative of, 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 of various uh, regions. Okay. Um, the first thing that we did is we said, well, what happens if we combine all the countries uh, what do we see? Uh, and this is it. And, and my only explanation for this is it's kind of a tower of Babel. Um, like it's kind of all over the place. Um, there's, 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 um, I don't know what to make of that. Uh, some of the patterns look pretty close. Are they really that unique? I don't know. But our interpretation sort of is, is like if you were thinking about this, is there a single shared understanding of democracy that works across places? Not by this our, our technique seems to suggest no, um, and, and, and that we would need to look some at local context. Now, there's a paper by uh, Gary King many years ago, uh, and it's been adapted within this context, where what they say is what we should you do is we should use vignettes to anchor sort of evaluations like this. So you, you get someone's sense of how they evaluate, whether they evaluate more positively or less positively, and then you use that. Now, maybe if we did this, we would get these, get these lines to line up better, but uh, this is what we have when we put it, put it all together. Um, when we run it by country, then we find out there's a lot of difference. Um, in some countries, in no country is there a uh, one profile solution. Uh, in, in, a, in a handful of countries, there's a two profile. Uh, in, in some, we have three profile solutions. Uh, and then in Serbia, it's a special case. It's the outlier with four profiles or four classes of understanding. And then here is what they look like in terms of uh, in, in terms of the distinction. And again, you can see there's some parallels and some some similarities across. And by by the way, Brazil's up there in the left corner. Um, in the U.S., compared to the data that we have uh, in the cooperative congressional election study, um, that we get a three-profile solution in this case. That's the the best fit to the data instead of the profile four-profile solution. So you start thinking, is this about the difference in the data? Is this about the difference in the time frame when we were doing it? What exactly might explain it? Uh, if, if this is capturing something that's real 
and that's meaningful and that we would want to think about um, over time. Okay. So, um, to sort of wrap it up, I think this is sort of, it strikes me as a promising approach uh, to get at this idea about what people are, are, are thinking about democracy uh, and, and about the, how they understand it, and, and to do so within their own terms without sort of throwing out the value-laden term of democracy itself uh, and, and or asking about sort of more uh, general satisfaction or some of the other uh, problems. Within the comparative context, uh, we think we see some evidence. We're still, uh, we're still working with that, that local context really matters and that we might expect to see different understandings of democracy depending on where you are. This goes to the heart of questions about how we can ask about democracy across country, uh, across nationally. Um, but there are a lot of questions that we have that remain. Uh, what's the overtime variation look like? Um, what are the relationships if we looked at left, right, right placement outside of the United States? Would it, would it, would it be different? Um, and then are they predictive of policy preferences and other types of uh, institutional trust, political trust, uh, and, and other types of democratic norms? To date, we've done some work looking at compromise, and we find that these, these uh, classifications really uh, work out pretty well in terms of predicting people's support for understanding of and valuing of compromise within a democratic political system. So, and that's it. Thank you very much, Kirby. Uh, that was very, very interesting and provocative. Um, we're gonna, we really like to encourage debate and discussion in the late afternoon seminars. And so uh, I want to start out by opening the floor and seeing if uh, anyone has any questions or comments. But I'm going to start with a comment uh, and a question for you to kind of try to spark the debate, but also for, to help encourage discussion uh, while people are thinking through what they're going to ask. Um, one of the things I, we had, we recently had actually Yash, Yashka Munk here at USPI, and we had a chance to debate uh, with him a little bit about his, his book and about his discussion. And one of the things that uh, we talked about and we've been talking and debating a little bit is the fact that when we think of democracy as a concept uh, and the foundation of democracy, and we think also of where we are and that we're in Latin America, uh, and we think about uh, if democracy really as a regime, if it, when, when do we transition to democracy and how, how established is democracy in different countries? Yeah. And so kind of a thought-provoking thing for you to, to ask, uh, and, and I'm eager for your thoughts is, we were talking and, and debating with him about the fact that we think about the alternation of political power uh, in Latin America, in the data that we've looked at, for example, it takes from the beginning, when you have regime change from an authoritarian regime to when a first democratic regime takes power, until you have a new party take power and alter power to a party from the opposition, the average in Latin America, it takes 20 years for that process to take place. So if we think uh, democracy and the transition to democracy and the fact that part of what we believe makes a democracy a democracy is ceding power to the opposition, that's actually very hard to do once even you establish the regime. Um, so kind of, I'm eager to hear your thoughts and your questions and, and what you think about that. And I think maybe... Your mic oh. is working. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I, I think what we're learning is that even in established democracies that, that the <laughs> that the democratic norms are, are can be eroded. Um, and I and I and I'm fairly convinced but but by some of that work, but part of it is so there's been this sort of argument that I think we've seen sort of our argument, the way I, I would classify them, anyone feel free to, to, to challenge this classification, is sort of the Monk argument that the, the democratic public is moving away from democratic norms, uh, and then the Levetsky, how democ well, it's really about elites, uh, and, and I think what we're seeing in some of the more recent work is it's really about both. 
um, that, the, that the public often is, is not fully supportive of the norms, um, but not because they don't think they're democratic. They think they're democratic. It's, I mean, if you look at, at Trump or other types of supporters, I think that they believe that they are being democratic, um, but because it's what they want. Mm. And, and so the ability to just sort of distinguish between um, what is, what, in a good understanding of what democracy is um, and, and what it, what it uh, allows versus what it doesn't, I think, is, is the real challenge. Mm. And, and I don't think we see that. Even in a even in a, even more established democracies, that people aren't willing to go against it when their side is losing, hmm. right? Or when their side is winning, for that matter. Maybe that's worse. So, hmm. okay, um, we're going to open the floor to questions. Glauco is going to help me. Um, he has the mic. I think it's on um, because it's a. We want to get to know you. We want to know who you are. If you ask a questions. Uh, if you can please say your name, where you're from, what you're doing at the summer school, uh, if you're taking, if you're part of the school, uh, as the talks also open to the public. If you're from outside the school, you're also welcome to ask a question. Uh, but if we have any questions, yes, we have always we always start this way, shy. <laughs> yes, people are thinking. Yes? Okay. I, Rita, yes? Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Rita. I'm a student here at the summer school uh, taking a regression course. And uh, my question relates to the How Democracy Dies book because uh, I read it at, and uh, I think that impressed me was how uh, the U.S. kept its democracy um, at the cost of its racial or, or social justice. And this is, uh, in a time of identity politics, my question is, uh, again, about that. Uh, how uh, today uh, can, can we um, see them as, I don't know, uh, um, like convergency concepts, or are we again uh, like trying to be Democratics at the cost of uh, some kind of justice, like gender, racial, or something like that. Yeah, I, th I think that goes to really the heart of the matter, and, and in terms of sort of, and my part of my interpretation of what's going on is that um, what you really have is, especially among younger people, uh, a greater sense of demo a greater sense of the things that they consider to be part of democracy, the justice components, the the equality components, the things that uh, that, that really matter uh, to them that some older generations and some and uh, often aren't seeing. So in, in the context of this, sort of the minimalist versus the maximalist, and, and I think if we had better indicators about identity, we would find that uh, even more strongly uh, that what you're, that, that the, uh, the the challenge really is uh, people who are expecting uh, democracy to do more than it is doing, uh, and especially on the economic inequality front, especially on the equality front, especially in, in, in saying this isn't what I signed up for, and that's where a lot of the dissatisfaction, I think, is, uh, is, is rooted. Yeah. Okay. And, and I should say, and then uh, uh, other generations who are saying this isn't the democracy that I thought we had, right? <laughs> so that's also... So, these are this is a real tension in terms of in, in terms of change, population change and and, and, and and cultural change is the feeling that what what I thought this this was about is no longer what it's about, while other people are saying this is about something different and it's not producing what we want. And I think that's the real tension. <laughs> so. Okay. Um. Hi, my name is Denise Delgado. I'm a PhD student at UMass Boston. I'm from Cuba, and I am doing the multi-method track here at the summer school. Uh, so I just want to add to that, um, because from uh, my program, what I have read is more recently about the fragmented democracy debate, mm -hmm. and I find it interesting, and it's more like the analysis from the public policy perspective. Mm -hmm. But I have a question. Is that we are transitioning in democratic way or in the democratic terms, mm -hmm. or is that there is a transition in the meaning of what democracy means? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think, I think both. Um, I, I think the, the what I think is 
going on is a transition in terms of we, we, we are adopting an increasingly expansive definition of democracy that, that is not meeting the expectations of, of, of the public. Other questions? Uh, Jonathan, I saw you had a... Your, yes? <laughs> yeah, I don't want to take the floor. I think Lorena did the introductions earlier, so I'll, I'll skip. But um, no, so, no, we don't know who you are. Okay, uh, Jonathan Phillips. <laughs> <laughs> right? He didn't introduce himself. Do we know who Sorry, he is? Sorry, Jonathan Phillips, Usby. Um, and I'll be teaching in the last uh, course of the semester, um, of, the, to school, of the summer school. Um, my question is actually a little related to the previous questions, I think, because one of the striking things from the clusters was that a lot of the different groupings seem to be really about different types of rights, like mm -hmm. social and economic versus more yes. literally just like uh, civil rights or electoral rights in terms of voting and ca being candidates and things. And one of the um, bigger sort of macro stories around the challenges of democracy has really been more about whether rights are even a thing at all or whether it's just majoritarianism, right? right. Like whether it's really right. just the rule of the majority and yeah. rights aren't any part of the equation of democracy. Mm -hmm. And what was striking in, in, in the, the clusters was that for each of the four groups, the majoritarian measure was like five, 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 yeah. five, yeah. right? Everyone mm -hmm. seems to have this division and this uncertainty about whether this is democracy is majoritarianism and the majority gets to decide everything or whether there are these basic rights. And that divides across all of these groups, across all ideologies. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder if, um, I know that it's sort of uh, an inductive methodology which brought out some of these clusters, but mm -hmm. is there any other um, way you think that we could cut this data or any other sort of uh, methodologies we could apply to try and see whether there's another dimension here which is really between not the different types of rights that people value, but the different ways that they think about how those allocative decisions and, and should be made, right, between the majoritarian and non-majoritarian non perspectives. That yeah. makes sense. Um, I, I don't know whether we can do it within the framework that, that we currently have set up. Um, one of the things that we are doing is we, we included in the module um, the measures of stealth democracy and some other procedural considerations. And so what we do hope to see how can that, you, that process consideration plays out in terms of uh, in, in terms of those indicators, yeah. You, no, sorry, I mean, Kirby, but we don't know what stealth democracy is. Okay, so yeah, so uh, <laughs> stealth democracy uh, w was a book, I can't remember the timing of it now, uh, by uh, John Hibbing and, and Elizabeth uh, Thies Morse. And, and, and what they did is they went in and they said that uh, um, for a lot of people in a democracy, what they really want is more efficient government. Uh, and they don't really want to see democracy, that the more they see of it, the, me the less they like it. Um, what they really want it is for it to take care of their problems. They don't want to be involved. They don't want to be engaged. Um, and, and I know some people have said they're not really stealth Democrats. They're really authoritarians. But, uh, but, but regardless, they, they like the idea of democracy at some level, uh, but, but they want it to be, be more efficient. So we'll be able to, to and, and we're in the process of sort of doing that analysis, what, what do those measures tell us and, and how do these uh, – these different distinctions work out. Um, to date, everything that we've sort of looked at, which is sort of reoccur our normative sort of take from some of this is it, it's a little bit more encouraging, I think, than some of the other work, that what we see is that the minimalists have an understanding of democracy, which is that it's not about the provision of social goods, but they're very much committed to, to democracy as a process. And the same thing with the maximalist. Um, and that, and so there are just these these distinct groups in terms of how they think. But so so far, I think, uh, if I were to tell you what I think we're going to find when we do the complete analysis, is that it's it's more encouraging than discouraging. That there's still a openness to process and a belief in process and, and process-based preferences that that, that matter. Uh, with a caveat going back, that the the real challenge with process-based preferences is when you lose. <laughs> whether you still adhere to the process, and, and I think that, that continues to be a challenge. Mm. So, yeah. Yes, Cecilia. Hi, I'm Cecilia. I'm a postdoc at Sing. Um, uh, similar also to the question about, I'm here at the summer school taking time series, um, and similar to, to the previous question and also about time, I was wondering if you have any insights about how the understanding of democracy has changed 
uh, what really struck me was when you did the word analysis and you said that in the 40s, people would be much bigger. And what yes. that suggests to me is yes. that this understanding of democracy has shifted from something that has to do a lot more with welfare to something that now has to do with uh, get the state out of my life. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> yes. Um, um, my, my sense is that, yeah, the meaning has changed um, in, in, in both those ways, uh, both in what you see in the word cloud, the, the greater importance of freedom, but and, and then also in the um, uh, in, in the in the groupings of, of different individuals, uh, the greater proportion of people who we can place into the maximalist category that are seeing democracy more in terms of the public goods. I think those two things have happened uh, at the same time, uh, it, which is odd because there's a certain tension between those things. But but I think that's. Um, uh, those things are going on. I don't have good evidence for that, so that's more of a sense. And one of the things that we would really like to do is be able to go back in time and build these classifications over time and see how, how they shift uh, and how much they shift uh, from, from one time period to the other. Um, I, I suspect that they I suspect that they shift. And, and especially, if nothing else, even if the classes remain the same, I think what you, you're going to see is the, the proportion of people in the classes uh, shifting remarkably. So I think there are 26 data where we have most of the people in the maximalist category. I'm not sure you would, you would see that if we could do the same thing 20 or 30 years ago. Um, and, I, and I suspect that the, the, the groups would be different depending on the time frame. But like I said, I don't have good evidence on that mm. at this point. So. Okay. Uh, other comment, comments, questions? insights that, that you guys want to give for Kirby about how think this might be different in Brazil or might be similar in Brazil is also welcome because he's here visiting and it's also really interesting to see how what he's saying and what he's talking about if you think or you disagree or agree or what you think about it in terms of how it applies to Brazil. What, one of the things that we, we, we sort of were speculating with and again just, just thinking about ideas uh, is that where you have that third group, you're more likely to have some sort of populist uh, movement. But that's, that was just a visual sort of inspection of the data, and, and, and I have no confidence in that other than throwing it out there as a, as a, as a, hypothesis, a poorly based hypothesis. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Gabriel. I'm from here, uh, USP. And I want to ask a more methodological question. Uh, since you use a machine learning model, mm -hmm. uh, how was it for you to use this this model? It's not so frequent in political science to use machine learning. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, what is what are the possible advantages and disadvantages? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So th so this this specifically is um, uh, an unsupervised machine learning model, um, and and so it's it's pretty naive in terms of in terms of its classification of of the groups. Um, I, I think it's helpful in a case like this, and, and the LCA models and the, and the latent profile models have, have, have been around for some time and have been used for, for various different things. So, so it's, not, it's not super uh, innovative that way. Um, I think the, the machine learning overall uh, and, and the capacity to do uh, training exercises in order to then get, get better data is, is, is incredibly uh, is is incredibly um, powerful. By the way, as a side note, we used our uh, POL, POLCA to estimate the models. The reason we did that is in Stata, it was really computationally complex in terms of trying to do it. Mm -hmm. And so the, some of the other people who have done this work, what they've done is they've taken these 11-point scales and they've taken cutoff points and they're saying, all right, we'll take 7 and below and 8 and 9 and then we'll have 10 as a category. Uh, and, we'll, and we'll use it that way because the model essentially wouldn't estimate um, in, unless you made some of these decisions. Uh, and that's the way we did it the first run through. What R allows you to do is to use the entire um, um, scope. It, it, it deals with the computational problems uh, much more effectively. And so uh, we, we used R instead. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you something, uh, maybe external to to the logic of the of the of the how the research was connected, but maybe uh, helps to solve the problem of the or the puzzle or connect with the puzzle of the change in time, because uh, 
it seems to me that the, the two hypotheses are, uh, as you said, uh, both elites and public opinion are connected, but the, one of the, the important, the, the possible connections of the two is the distance between, uh, the distance of your defeat. So I, I'm, 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 I get concerned about democracy or I get fed up with democracy if my group loses, but I get really fed up if my group, if a group very far from, the, from my group wins. Yes. Mm. And so this is maybe something that has uh, explains the change in time. Because uh, what has been happening in, in politics all over the world in the last 10 years is, that, uh, uh, is a shift of the distances between who is winning from one side and who is winning to the other side. And so this may be something that produces a change in the, in the, in the connection between the two hypotheses in time between the 50s and nowadays. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, I think that's right. I think uh, the, the, the reality of polarization in the, in the contemporary period means that um, the, so there, there are sort of two issues. One is what's the actual distance and then what's the perceived difference, but unquestionably uh, the perceived dist distance has gone up, which has made people less settled in terms, of, in, in terms of the outcome and less willing to accept the outcome, uh, which is which is playing into, into the question about democratic norms. Yeah. Hmm. Extra, uh, uh, yes? I, I came to, the, to that side to see if they speak, but it's only toward yes. the, the right. D don't ask me how I inverted the matrix. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> don't worry, don't worry. No, I, one thing I was wondering about, like, the, you know, uh, I, I thought the analysis was really cool, uh, but I was thinking back to that word cloud, and yeah. it seems like uh, you would expect to see some differences across those groups if you did the word cloud broken out by that. And I don't know if you have or not. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't, like, what would you expect to see if you did it? Yeah, um, that's a that's a good question. We haven't we haven't uh, looked at the word cloud specifically that way. We we were looking at it um, in doing some differences by you know. Uh, other other types of characterizations. Um, so one of the so just based on the categories, I would hope to see equality and, and other terms showing up more among the maximalist and freedom showing up more among the minimalist. Uh, and that's a, that's a nice yeah that's a nice thing to to look at. The distribution is such. I wonder whether it's true because freedom comes up so so mm -hmm. heavily in terms of the responses. Um, but but yeah, I think that that's a that's a great thing to look at, and, and and so when you think about the distribution, we have way more maximalists than than minimal. Well, not way more, but we have more. Um, so how would that play out in terms of uh, in, in terms of comparing the two? I, I I think it would have to show up that there's a greater probability of not taking freedom of the ma and if not, then I would worry about some of the validity of our <laughs> of our classifications. So yeah. Hmm. Okay. Yes, other questions, comments? No? Okay. Um, well, with that, um, we're going to end the first late afternoon seminar of the summer school. Uh, just to remember that we have next week, uh, we, the conversation on identity com politics continues. We have a round table with Jason Seawright and Melanie Kamet. Uh, two of the faculty who are incoming next week who will be talking about how do we eva evaluate and measure identity uh, looking at evidence around the world about identity politics. So we'll, we're going to keep this, some of, some of this conversation is going to continue. Um, and what we wanted to do is invite everyone. There's a reception outside. And so please uh, continue the conversation and enjoy the, the Brazilian sweets. Thank you. Thank you.